Let's see if we can find some good old fashioned house music. people you throw a rock you're gonna hit five DJs in Chicago. I felt that we could take this music and make it into something big. We really did move the boundaries because we didn't know what the boundaries were. We barely knew what we were doing and that was the genius of it. I don't think we thought about the fact that it was a movement. We just knew that we were on to something. I usually start it right from the get. It's an old Paul McCartney song, so everybody recognizes it. Somebody's ringing the bell. Says my message. Let the people in, baby. It's 1970, and I had been going out dancing a little bit and collecting records. And I'm at a party at my brother's house, and it's the most boring party, Snoresville, USA. Everyone's falling asleep. So I put on "You're the One" or something like that, and. This girl comes out of the bedroom and says, hi, I'm Dale, I'm dating your brother. You like this music? I wanna take you to a fabulous party. 647 Broadway, I'll never forget it. David Mancuso's Loft. We go in this little hallway, open the door, and I move on to this dance floor. And as the record is playing, it comes to a peak, and these bright lights go on, and then everything goes off, and all I hear is this sound. This perfect sound. I knew in my soul, in my heart, in all my body, that that music was moving me to my core, and I knew it was gonna move a lot, a lot of people. And that was, for me, the beginning of dance music. The music is just a reflection of the culture. It's a microcosm of what's actually happening out in the world. People started to ask for their voices to be heard. The women's movement, the gay movement, black power movement, all these things started to cross-pollinate each other and we became comrades. And it played itself out in nightclubs. The loft made you feel welcome, regardless of where you were coming from, if you were gay, straight, black, white, Puerto Rican. It was the precursor, the template, for those clubs that would follow. When the gallery opened, everybody showed up there. We went from having 80 to 100 people to having 600 people. An overnight success needs more staff, more food, more everything. I hired Frankie Knuckles, and he said to me, I have this friend, his name is Larry Levan, I'd like to bring him. And I said, we need two people on balloons. Fine, I trust your judgment. At 12 months, Larry started playing at the Continental Bets, and Frankie worked his lights. Larry took all the influences that he had, David at the loft, me at the gallery, and he was a great DJ, right out of the box. And then six or eight months later, Frankie took over for Larry at the Bets. He sounded and played just like Larry played. He didn't really have an identity as a DJ when he was in New York. Two hundred six South Jefferson, in house the warehouse with the great Frankie Knuckles. Three levels of pure partying. It's like uh, 
a landmark in my mind. Chicago was dead, and the people there was never introduced to an after hours scene like the loft in New York. So I launched the warehouse. It was a private gay club that opened up at 12 midnight and closed at like 8 in the morning, something like that. The people in Chicago had never heard a sound system like that. People were losing their minds. Initially, I didn't have a DJ, so I had to go back to New York and ask Larry LeBrand and a couple others to come out and play. And they told me no, but in New York, Frankie Knuckles was in the shadows of Larry LeBrand, so he was not going to go anywhere there. And when he saw the place, he was like, yeah, this is cool for a club. This area, this was a coat room right here, this area right here, where that guy's office is, where it used to be my office. All of this was open. Okay, hello sir, how are you? This used to be a dance club, the whole building. Yeah, in the 70s. Right here is where you went down to the dance floor. Frankie played right here. From here all the way back here was the DJ booth. During the disco era, it was the worst financial time in America since the Great Depression. We had a very, very horrible recession. Culturally, in America, things were pretty bad. Every record company had their version of this cover. And this is a, this is a nice, like, you know, tasteful one, disco single, okay? Disco single. And the Atlantic one covered half of the thing, disco single. People would go in the store and unplayed, unlistened to, don't know the record, 100,000 copies would sell just because it said this on it. They started putting this banner on every piece of shit they wanted to sell. And after two years of that, this became really a bad taste in people's mouth. It was billed as Teen Night at Comiskey Park for the Twine Eye doubleheader between the Chicago White Sox and the Detroit Tiger. The feature attraction was a disco demolition between games. Local radio morning man Steve Dahl was the catalyst. He is anti disco. Between games, Dahl was to finish by blowing up a box full of disco records, which the fans were to bring with them to the ballpark. But some seven to 10,000 fans poured onto the field, setting bonfires and burning more disco records. By the time Chicago police were able to clear the field, the damage had been done. I was an usher, taking people to their seat at ball games while saving up money for my first synthesizer. Steve Dahl was on the radio saying that disco sucked. He was frustrated because he had been fired from DAI because they changed from a rock format to a disco format. I was on the ground at the front gate, and all of the records that were piling up at the gate weren't necessarily disco records. Most of them were just black records. The message was, well, if you're black or you're gay, then you're not one of us. You're not truly a Chicagoan. We didn't think that it was real. We just thought that people were having fun, but it played out in our lives in a very dramatic way. All of a sudden, there was sort of a them and us. And I think that us was strong because we went further underground. We went deeper. I remember the first time I saw you was at the warehouse. Was it? You had on this taffeta skirt, maybe a pink top. Oh my God, do you remember that? Heck no. I went to the warehouse when I was 15 years old. There was this place on 63rd, and we used to always go, everybody went over there to get a phony Illinois state ID. Or you could just take somebody's random birth certificate. <laughs> <laughs> I was 16 years old, my first time going to the warehouse. I had heard all kinds of rumors and things about, you know, being a gay club. But once you got into the music, none of that even mattered anymore. The warehouse was a members only club. They want people to go there and not bring any of that outside shit in. You know, no homophobia, no sexism towards women. 
Sound system at the warehouse was designed by Richard Long, one of the best sound designers in the world. You can go in the warehouse and you can experience the music. You can literally sit there high or not, because the, the music will make you high. I stumbled into the warehouse by word of mouth. It wasn't like, oh, oh, that's music, and I'm gonna go dance to that. It was like, what is this? I've never experienced anything like this in my life. House music at that time, it was anything that Frankie Knuckles would play at the warehouse, which was the coolest underground dance music. Some groups you wouldn't hear anywhere else except for the warehouse, yeah. which is what you know what you would crave. Like I only heard that song here. You'd have Europe and Philadelphia and New York all playing on the same dance floor. No matter what style of music it was, if it fit into the set. It worked, so you heard all sounds, textures in the course of the night. Some of the records were too short, so Frankie would mess with them and have two copies and make them longer and also, like, play the breakdown twice or play the best part a couple of times or skip the shitty part. I mean, I almost couldn't quite figure out if there were songs at one time, because sometimes it was just like this sort of soundscape. One of the sound effects Frankie would do would be this train that gets louder and louder and louder, and until it comes by you, it was like a revelation. He didn't just mix a couple of records. He brought in a whole new style of music. That's something. Frankie would give out these tapes of his mixing. Those cassettes would go around to thousands of people because people would make copies of copies of copies of copies. You hear a Frankie Knuckles remix and you know it's Frankie Knuckles. That style of DJ spread throughout the city because of those tapes. We didn't have too many places to party because of the gang problem in Chicago. So we would prefer to sit at home between house parties and we would listen to Frankie tapes. The city had said the warehouse was no longer safe. Like, it might cave in, so you better stop. And Frankie was like, oh, it's a good chance for me to become a club owner. So that's when he opened up the club, the power plant. I didn't have a DJ, so I approached Ron Hardy. I got a new club for you, the music box. When I first went to the music box, I was about 16. And when I went, I heard music playing like, walking up. The closer I got, the harder it felt. Like, who, 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 who? I never heard anything like that in my goddamn life. Ron Hardy was just like, yeah, all night, all night, you know. Ron Hardy at the Music Box would play anything at any time, anywhere, any kind of way. He would spin them backwards, he would scratch the needle across the record. I loved listening to Roddy because you never knew what you were going to get. His actual style came out of him being a heroin addict because he thought the music was a little slow, so he pitched it up. So as I remember the music box, it was in the lower Wacker Drive area, you know, an area that was loading docks. It always looked the same time. It was lit differently. It was almost green, as I remember. It felt like you were in a sci-fi movie. Went in there, pitch black, one cheesy color light bulb. Couldn't see nothing in there. There were no seats, no chairs, just a big dance floor. Music was so loud that you were forced to dance to it. 
When I think back to the early days, listening to Ron Hardy play, listening to Frankie play, my thrill was really the way that they were directing the crowd, keeping moving them higher and just higher, and just bringing them into, I mean, just crazy frenzies. There was a, a good period of time where I was just going over different people's houses and learning how to DJ, basically, until I got my own equipment. Then I was in my basement for eight hours a day. I'd be up till four o'clock in the morning. My mom wouldn't even know. I taught myself how to scratch, how to put records in reverse and make them stay on beat, and how to phase two records together. When I first started DJing, I had to bring my whole sound system. We used to have sound clashes, like against each other in gyms, you know? Back then, we had to buy two copies of every record. That's how you did tricks back in the day. You would, you know, cut one and two, and that's how, that was our equivalent of sampling and stuff. If we had a new record that nobody else knew about, we take a magic marker and we black out the whole label so that if some other DJ came over and said, hey, what's that your plan? They have no idea. And we proceeded to get out there and just DJ every high school party you could imagine, every Sweet 16, every anything. A lot of schools in the late 70s, early 80s would throw dances to raise money for school activities. Mendo was an all-Catholic boys' school. They found quite a business in these high school dances. People would come from all over the city to go to these parties. Back then, I was doing promotions myself, and uh, I bought Frankie Knuckles to Mendo. I made $10,000 in high school. i never forget it, too, because I had a Louis Vuitton briefcase, and I had all the money in the briefcase. These parties kind of bridged that gap and kind of made the connection with the underground gay disco scene and these middle-class black kids on the South Side. That was the perfect storm for what was to become house music. Jamie's record, Your Love, was like the anthem for years. Mm -hmm. Everybody wanted a copy of it. We were making cassettes, so somebody got lucky enough to get a reel-to-reel, -reel and they made cassettes. And I actually pressed one up. I paid like $50 at Universal to make an acetate of it. That's how big that record was. Car blasting, going down Rush Street, all those yeah. places. Down. Everybody's car doors, windows down, blasting it. I mean, no wonder it was kind of the catalyst for the beginning of this whole thing. Everyone has a different opinion of where House came from and who started it. Back around 84, it started to mold into a particular sound. It started to be a particular pattern that you start hearing. And then it got labeled house music. Jamie Principal, he was a guy from Chicago who had some music in his ears and he put it down on tape. And then somehow Frankie got a hold of it and started playing it. It became a cassette tape that was passed around because Frankie played it at the warehouse and everybody heard it there. Jamie Principal, Your Love was huge in Chicago. It must have been 10,000 copies of that tape. And we would all sit in our houses and listen to them. I thought it was European. You know, I didn't know he was a brother from Chicago. It was one of those things that when you hear it, you knew something special was about to happen. Would you grab this over here, please? Okay, here we go. This is, this is a test pressing of on and on the Jesse Sanders, uh, 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 you know, it turned out to be a classic, and as you see, it's probably it's probably brand new. I had become pretty popular as a DJ. Vince Lawrence started coming around and brought me his record. I think I was 17 years old. I had put together my group of friends, Z Factor, and we had written our first song, Fast Cars. I wanted to keep him around and kind of pick his brain because I had ideas to make a record. At the time, I played this bootleg mashup with Donna Summer, Toot Toot, Hey Beep Beep in it, and 
It had the horn from Funky Town. It had such a mesmerizing groove that I thought it would be perfect to be kind of a signature song for me. But somebody stole my records, and that was one of them. And it pissed me off so much that I decided that I was going to make my own version. So Vince Lawrence and I are in my bedroom, which at the time was our studio. I have my four-track recorder, my Poly 61, and an 808. Roland said that the 808 was designed as a practice device. But for us, you know, this was the beginning. We just really wanted to make a record that would move people the way the best parts of the best songs move people at those parties. I think I had $800 to my name at the time and met Larry Sherman, who ran the pressing plant, and said, hey, I want to get you know, as many 12-inch records of, of this as I can get. So we started pressing. We learned the pressing process. We'd be at the plant, package it myself, pick them up, and just take them to the stores and sell them. It started snowballing so much that we had to come down here to this basement, and we formulated it like a business. I remember standing right here when they did the ABC TV news interview, and I first told them that I wanted to be the next Motown in Barry Gordy, Jesse Records. We went from store to store to store like a paper route. And we might have sold 10 or 12,000 records that first week. I said, fuck parties, we're in a record business now. I felt that we could take this music and make it into something big. It didn't matter that on and all was a bootleg of a bootleg of a bootleg. It was a record. I don't think House would exist without On and On having been pressed. Before that, I don't think any of us ever dreamed that we could make a record at home. The entire city woke up and started making records. Everybody started doing it. Because I didn't have a lot of background in music, I wasn't constrained by the laws of making music. A light bulb just went off in everybody's head. Man, they went crazy, like bananas. I mean, I thought like, oh, it's evolved. That was quick. Let's see if it's as good as it used to be. My first drum machine, I don't know if it counts, but as a drum machine, but it was a Casio. The little the Casio, Casio tone? The, or, the one that goes doop, 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 doop. That's the only beat it did. And I was like, uh, let me get a Dr. Rhythm. That was the next one. Was I just kept graduating, graduating. Then I borrowed Jesse's drum machine sometimes. I used Jesse's 808 on the whole Jack tracks. Oh, OK. Did you know Vince had loaned that to me? No, I had no idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> Is this the first time hearing of that? Yes. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, my 808 created some of the best records to come out of Chicago, That's so true. I'm good with that. There you go. Your 808 was at the beginning of house music. So seeing me make a record like On and On, other DJs saw that they could do the same thing or better. Everybody in the city knew Jesse as a DJ. A light bulb just went off in everybody's head. Hey, I'm a DJ. I can make records too. Another thing, it wasn't the most polished production in the world. I could do like that. I could do something like that and make a record. So, bang. When I got into it, I wasn't trying to be an artist, per se. I was just trying to add on to my competitive advantage as a DJ. Turn to Jack. Tap, 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 turn to Jack. Tap, 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 turn to Jack. Time to Jack was the first song that turn actually put that word Jack turn into a record. Turn to Jack. Turn to Jack. Jacking is kind of like holding on to something, someone, or the wall, wall and just like speaker. doing this. If you were at any other party and you saw somebody doing that dance, you knew what was up. 
you all automatically had a connection because you knew where they went, where they partied at. Because I didn't have a lot of background in music, I wasn't constrained by the laws of making music. The true root of house music will always be the technology that you use to create it. A lot of people talk about how minimalist early drum machines were. But to us, it was the best we could afford. So we didn't think about it as minimal. To us, it was maximum. We didn't let money stop us. We had to go to secondhand shops just to get music equipment. We couldn't pay to go to studios but we weren't gonna let the fact that we couldn't get in a recording studio keep us from getting music out there. Time to Jack. Tracks Records came about when Larry Sherman, who ran the pressing plant, he saw all these tracks that we were releasing. And so he said, we should start a label. Larry just really kind of took things over. And the only real place to bring your track was to Larry, because he'd sign anything and anybody. It was all about get what you can get right now. So we'll make tracks quick and sell them real quick. Tracks is, is very controversial. There's no doubt about that. Because yeah, a lot of stuff went on. People complain about the early tracks records because they had the snap, crackle, and pop. Larry Sherman would buy these skids of vinyl records. I think they'd get them for about two cents a piece. And there was a guy that would take these vinyl records and had a sledgehammer and would take a hammer, put it over a barrel, and knock out the middle of the records. And then they put them in the grinder. They would melt them down. And you know, into the little. And make new records. I remember some of the copies that we would get here at the club. You'd look and go, oh, this is one of the good ones, <laughs> or this is one of the bad ones. I didn't care how they were making the records. I thought my music was going to be so good that people wouldn't care what it was pressed on. I worked the graveyard shift at the post office. The hours were 12 midnight to 8.30 a.m., so that's party hours are out of the question. I DJ mostly in my basement. Nobody knew me. We recorded Move Your Body on a Roland 707 drum machine, a Roland JX8P keyboard, and a Prophet 2000 keyboard. And that was it. I was going for Elton John's vibe because Elton John sounded like he was a piano player from church back in the day. I mean, he would jam. I played it like 40 beats per minute and I sped it up. When I played it back, it was playing at 120. It was really cool how, you know, it would sound natural. After a period of time, someone began to do something a little more musical. And I point to Marshall Jefferson. As it was, horrible songwriting in house music. You know, horrible. You got DJs doing it, and they don't know anything about crescendos or building or anything. People say, oh, where's that piano come from? That's not house music. It is now. And you went on the dance floor, people were like in frenzy over this music. There used to be a giant armory in, at the end of Lakeshore Drive downtown, and then we would pack that place. An armory would be packed with house heads. I see all these figures, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, all sweating, all smiling, all dancing, all enjoying. This is where I want to be. This is what I, what I want to be a part of. I tried to up my game. I want to try to up my production skills with each record. I more or less left the beginning formats behind and, you know, I was able to expand the genre. No, no, I'm serious, baby. No, no, listen. All of them did records. I did entire genres. I don't like pat myself on the back, but uh, I, I honestly do think I did that. What the fuck is this? What is this? 
how do you make that sound? What is that? The original intent of the Roland TB303 bass line was to be an accompaniment to a piano or a keyboard player. In fact, they advertised it and promoted it with um, jazz musician and pianist Oscar Peterson. It shows him sitting there with the 303 and the 606, but it was never meant to record with. It was never meant to perform with. I remember we picked up one for like 40 bucks. When we got it, it just played straight. And I was like, hmm, this doesn't sound that interesting. I decided to just start turning the knobs to it just to see what, what that could do. And then next thing you know, it became a jam session. Spanky started programming hi-hats and claps and drum beats in the 707. And we were just jamming out for like a good hour straight and recorded it live. And we just looked at each other and said, wow, that was, that was crazy. And I remember saying, yeah, but who would play it? And Spanky said, only one person would play this, Ron Hardy. If you were from Chicago and you were making this new house music sound and you had a new record, Rodney would put it right on. Ron Hardy definitely influenced us to try different things in our music that we wouldn't normally try. What if I bring in the hi-hat right there and what if I do a crazy hi-hat that just goes and it has a flange on it? We would all, almost be like, man, would Ron like that? <laughs> So we went to the music box and told the bouncer or whatever what we wanted to do, and Ron let us come in. When he listened to the tape, we were looking for some type of emotion, but he just sat there thinking. Then he looked up, he said, when can I get a copy? And so he played it like really early in the night when he used to test out music. People kind of like just looked at each other and like, what is this? But then he played it four times. Man, they went crazy, like bananas. This guy was on his back, kicking his legs up in the air. People were just going nuts. And it, and then, and it just, like an explosion, like. The effect of this record when Ron played it was crazy. When acid tracks began to permeate so many of the club tracks, it was really great. I mean, I thought like, oh, it's evolved. So-called house music was first made in the creators' houses, but it was also performed at clubs called The Warehouse and Powerhouse. However it got its name, it's one of the hottest things going, and as Jay Levine reports, it may only be a matter of time before house musicians become heroes in their own home. <laughs> They started playing house music at this Michigan Avenue hotel and health club last summer, and they've been packing them in ever since. It's the first time house has escaped the south side dance clubs or north side juice bars for a more upscale audience, though it's still a long way from sweeping the city. But in London, house has made it to the top of the pops faster than anything since the Beatles. I had no idea that house music had went overseas. I mean, to me, London was just a place on a map. Record Mirror came over and interviewed me, and I asked the guy, there's a lot of black people over there in the house music? And he was like, well, not, not really. He said, the scene is mostly Caucasian. And I was like, white people like house music? I did Move Your Body. The first time I brought it to the music box, Ron Hardy played it six times in a row. Sleazy, my friend, he gave Frankie Knuckles a copy of it. So Frankie started playing it, it really got big. Frankie Knuckles' best friend was Larry LeVan at the Paradise Garage in New York. Larry LeVan started playing it. Next thing I know, this guy from the UK starts calling me up. His name was Jazzy M. He was in London and he played on uh, this pirate radio station called LWR. I'm thinking like, what the fuck, what, what's going on here? We went to the Berry Island Festival in Wales, and I saw like 10,000 
kids camping out and listening to music. And that's when it really said, you know, this is a global thing. People can understand it. I was getting feedback from friends that were in London about what's this music? What are these records? They come on this red label with tracks on it. It's a Chicago house label. Someone is getting that message out to the rest of the world. This is the Hacienda. You know, it may not look much, but it is the cathedral to house music in Britain. During the summer of 1988, I was studying in Manchester University, and a friend said, let's go to the Hacienda. It's this kind of amazing club. We walked into the venue, and it was like this level of energy that I had never witnessed before. The music was an outer-worldly, deconstructed, postmodern samples coming in and out. Many of us had never heard anything like this at the time. The music happens to coincide with the arrival of ecstasy in the United Kingdom, and that particular drug combined with a sound becomes a kind of explosion of house music uh, in the summer of 1988, the summer of love. I was excited and also angry at the same time. I never knew what was going on overseas until people came over and tried to interview me. And they were telling me what was going on. Larry Sherman, he realized that these tracks were going to be something, so he made sure that he had all the publishing from everybody on it so he could make deals. Larry Sherman used to always tell me he only sold in New York, Chicago, and Detroit. We didn't have a clue about publishing and all of that kind of stuff. And then everybody realized that, um, you know, there was a lot going on that a lot of people didn't know about. Around that time, a new mayor got elected in Chicago and he started cutting the parties off early, like making it where you couldn't go really late. And then the radio stations started changing their format at the same time, stopped playing house music on the radio. So the combination of those things kind of really led to me feeling like the life was just dying and getting sucked out of the scene. Look, we weren't musicians, man, you know? That's the end of the story right there. We weren't musicians, we weren't songwriters. We did what we did, you know? We did extremely good for our talent level. But overall, I don't think we had the musical talent to progress to that next level. Other people took it to the next level, you know, briefly, but I don't think the songwriting was there. We were focused on the groove. We had great grooves, so. And uh, I, that's what we did. When House came in, they had that thing that we seemed to have lost. We got caught up in the, the commerciality of it, but people, they don't really care how you make it. They just want it to move them. The movement on the dance floor, it's a release for people. And that release is so primally important that people will take it in many different forms. Chicago has always been kind of a trendsetter when it comes to music, from jazz to blues to R&B to gospel, you name it. All we wanted to do was dance. So anything that would make you get up and shake your ass is what we would play. And that inspired people to want to go on and do their own tracks. A house of music was important because it showed the non-musician that he could make music. I think technology, it broadened the capability of what we could do because we could really be experimental. I know that house is the basis for all these dance musics that are coming out now, all of them. I just believe house is the mother of them all. We made this stuff on nothing and look what it's done. Any movement takes a community of like-minded people to move it forward. We were competitive as DJs and producers, but we felt like we were in the same club and we very much so wanted to do whatever we needed to do to help that club grow and spread as far as it can go.